Welcome back to AP Physics. We're in the final week of new content. We have about three or four days of new content, and that will wrap it up. So, last week, last Thursday, we pondered quite a bit on Faraday's Law of Induction. I want to start by summarizing that, and then most of what we're going to do today is going to be conceptual applications that's going to bring like the whole year together, more or less. So, Faraday's law of induction. Induced EMF is equal to negative N d phi dt. So, when you have change, when you have a changing magnetic flux and magnetic flux, that is a B dot A, either the magnetic field is changing, the angle between the field and the area vector is changing, or the area is changing, or some combination of those, but you have change. That's the key. You have to have change, and when you have change, you induce an EMF, a voltage, to occur in a wire, in a loop, in whatever, as long as you have that changing magnetic flux. Now, tons and tons of technologies as a result of that that we're going to get into. First of all, I want to talk about this situation. Going back a little bit, we have a charge. Charge is moving into an external magnetic field, and we want to know what happens. Well, our original force equation, QV crossed into B, says that we'll get a force on this moving charge. So if we do the right-hand rule, pointing our fingers to the right, wrapping them out of the screen, our thumb's going to point downward, but then we have to remember, hey, this is an electron. And if this is an electron, we have to reverse. So originally from the cross product, we got down. Well, when this electron gets over here into the field, it's going to experience a magnetic force that is upward because it's a negative charge. So then what happens if we take that electron and it's actually not just a free electron, but it is inside of a wire. Well, as we move that wire across, that electron, let's see if I can move our wire across, as we move our wire across and our ele electron's going to stay there, that electron is still going to experience a force. And because it experiences a force, now I'm just going to redraw. As we continue to move it across that field, we will imagine the field continues, we will push those electrons to the top of the wire. And so we're going to get a negative charge at the top, because we take electrons from somewhere, we're going to have a positive charge at the bottom, which means we have a separation of charges, and we are going to have a voltage across that wire. That is known as a motional EMF. So, motional EMF, we're going to start with our equation. Faraday's law, negative N d phi dt. N, well, we kind of have a loop here because more or less you can think of if we extend it across there, we actually have an area in there, but we only have at best one loop. So that N, I'm going to drop that and say that's just a one. Flux, that's B dot A, DT. Well, B is not changing, but you are sweeping out an area. So I'm going to go negative B, my area here. Well, if we label the area, I'm going to have some length of my wire. And then I'm going to have some dimension this way. I'm going to call that a delta X. So then the area would be basically an L delta x. I'm going to flip on the bottom from my calculus over to my algebra, delta t. And then what we get right here is a delta x over delta t. So then the EMF that we induce 
is equal to negative b times l times v. The faster we pull the wire, the more motion, the more motion, the stronger the force, the stronger the force, the more charges move, the more separation of charges, the higher the voltage or the induced voltage. That is referred to as an emotional EMF. Now, that idea is the basis of an electrical generator. An electrical generator, I'm going to highlight on this screen and then I'm going to move over to a simulation. We have a wire that I'm highlighting there in green. We have a wire and that wire is being turned. We are hand cranking this wire to turn. So it is moving in that magnetic field. Because it moves in that magnetic field, forces will be applied, magnetic forces will be applied to the charges in that wire and they will be made to move and we will generate electricity. So a generator, you move the wire, you supply the mechanical energy, the output is the electrical energy, the electric current. The opposite of that is an electric motor. In an electric motor, you supplied the current, the electrical energy, the magnetic field resulted in a torque being applied to the loop, causing the loop to turn, i.e. you have uh, mechanical energy, rot rotational kinetic energy. Now, let's take a look at this in simulation. There's our moving coil. Now, notice the graph at the top. That's the electric potential energy per unit time. We can think of that synonymous with the current also. So then what you have, if you think of the coil, one side of the loop is moving up and it gets to the top and then it starts moving back down and the other side is moving up and then it moves down. And what, that ha what, cause what happens then is that you switch the direction that the charges are flowing and you get that alternating current. We talked about with an electric motor using a commutator. This one doesn't have a commutator in it. If I flip it over to use a commutator, now you've got a split cylinder, that red cylinder with a black line in the middle of it that is rotating. And now you have a direct current, but it's a messy direct current because what you do is basically flip the current over so it does not dip down below the axis into the other direction it stays in one direction but it still oscillates from zero to a maximum as that current flows okay generator you are supplying the turning and by you in electrical generators we use in power plants what is supplying the turning is perhaps water flowing that turns generators or we burn whatever coal to produce heat energy to boil water steam turns turbines which then generate the electricity so by whatever means we are supplying the turning and we are getting electrical energy out of it lots of applications today i so wish we were in the classroom for this um, Perhaps other technologies that use induction that you're more familiar with, shake flashlights. If you had one of those or seen one of those, up here, notice right there, there is a coil of copper wires inside there that is much harder to be able to see. Probably right in there, there is a magnet. And when you shake the flashlight, that magnet goes up and down, up and down through that coil. And as it moves through that coil, you have a D5D T, which means you induce an EMF in the coil. And inducing the EMF in the coil, the current flows, you charge a battery, you run the flashlight. There are also to the right of that a crank flashlight. When you're cranking the handle, you are moving either a coil or a magnet. One's moving relative to the other and you are inducing an EMF and a current to be able to run that flashlight. Then below, we have a crank radio, and really this technology is not new. We have our original 
crank telephones. Over here on the side, right here, there is that crank handle, and you would crank the handle to be able to generate some electricity, and then you'd make a call. That predates me. Never used one of those. But I just want to make the point that the technology is a little bit older. Now, getting into other applications, a GFI, maybe you have an outlet in your house that looks something like this one right there. I have one in my bathroom. I have one in my kitchen. Usually these GFI outlets that have a quick turn off are found near water sources. So typically in your bathroom, if you're not sure, go walk to your bathroom and check it out. There's probably a good chance that you have one in there. So in that GFI, basically, if you're in the bathroom, say you are drying your hair so you can look nice, even though you're not going to leave the house. You are drying your hair with that hair dryer and you accidentally drop it into the sink full of water. Don't do that. If your ha other hand is in the water, you're going to get electrocuted. What's going to happen is there's going to be a spike of electrical current. And if you wait for the fuse box to be able to trip the circuit breaker, it's going to take a couple of seconds to be able to trip that circuit. All the meantime, you are frying electrically. So what we have is an outlet that makes it a quicker process. Iron ring right there. And basically, that's iron is going to, in simple terms, amplify the magnetic field that is there. It's changing your permeability constant. You have a sensing coil right here. And that sensing coil, if the current that is going into and back from the outlet suddenly increases, then that's going to cause a DFI DT. And when you cause a DFI DT in this sensing coil, it's going to cause a spike in current through that loop. And it's going to flip this circuit breaker and turn that electricity off to that outlet in an instant. So it is a safety device that you have in your house. Metal detectors. Metal detectors are also using induction. If you have a metal detector, as shown down here on the bottom, basically what you're doing is it pulses the current through a coil in that bottom round disc. And in that pulsing of the current, that changing current, you produce a changing magnetic field, a d phi dt. In the ground, it will induce an eddy current in anything that is metal under the ground. And that changing current causes a changing magnetic field, a second d phi dt. That d phi dt induces current in the round disc part of the metal detector, which is then sensed and causes an alarm to go off that says, hey, there's buried treasure under the ground here or a buried rusty, rusty piece of metal, whatever it is. In this simulation, you can see that the coil in the metal detector emits the blue field, d phi dt, because there's a changing current in it, that phi dt causes eddy currents in the buried quarter under the ground, and it echoes a signal, which then is received by the same coil. So in your coil, your, your sensing coil doubles as kind of the emission coil. You pulse a current through it, and then you wait for the return signal. By the same idea in metal detectors in airport security, you pulse a current, causes currents in anything metal, and that metal responds. Induction stoves. There's a good chance you don't have one of these. You might, but they're not that common quite yet. Induction stoves basically don't use heat directly. So then if you had an induction stove in your house, you could turn the burner on high and put your hand on the burner just like our person here, and you wouldn't get burned because what's going on is there are coils of wire in the stove 
that have an alternating current in them. They are producing a changing magnetic field, and they will induce then eddy currents, changing electric currents in the metal of the pan to then dissipate that electrical energy into heat energy and directly cook your food. It's a very efficient way of cooking, but you only induce the eddy currents in a ferromagnetic substance, a substance that is typically iron-based. Anything else is not going to respond, and you're not going to induce currents in it. So it is very efficient because you're not radiating heat out everywhere. You are still radiating out some, but you are radiating or you are transferring that energy directly into heat energy in the pan, which then goes directly into whatever is in the pan. Electric guitars... Electric guitars also use induction. You have on your electric guitar, right there, the pickups. And those pickups are magnets. Here's my word magnet slightly showing there. So we have the guitar string. And when we pluck that guitar string, it moves, it vibrates back and forth. Well, the guitar string is metal. And the metal will respond and become magnetized due to the permanent magnet in the pickups. When that guitar string vibrates, you have that moving magnetic section, and that induces a current in your pickup coil that is right there. And that induced current in your pickup coil exactly matches the vibration, the D phi DT, or the vibration of the metal guitar string. So it directly converts, shown down here, the vibration of our string into an electrical signal that can then be amplified, processed, converted back in a speaker related, kind of the opposite process. But a normal speaker, you have a copper coil and that coil is surrounded by magnets. And here are parts of the permanent magnets there. When you send a current through the coil, so on the top diagram here, you have current going through that coil. That current, if that is a signal, say a signal from a song from a radio station, it is a varying electrical current. Well, that varying electrical current will, because it's in your magnetic field here, experience varying forces and that varying forces will cause this coil to oscillate up and down in pa the same pattern as that variation in the signal, causing that speaker membrane here to vibrate, which will then vibrate the air and produce sound. So, reverse process, but it fits well in here, so I decided to put it in here. Wireless phone chargers, same idea. If you have a wireless phone charger, you set your phone on that pad, and that pad basically has a coil in it, and that coil has a varying electric current. That varying electric current then sets up a varying magnetic field, and that varying magnetic field induces an EMF, or a varying current, in a second coil that is inside your phone, shown on the top there, and that varying current recharges your phone. On a larger level, we have rail-guided vehicles. It's the same process as that phone charger, but now you're powering entire vehicles in industry that run. There is a coil buried in the cement of the factory floor. There is a second coil in the base of the vehicle, and you oscillate a current in the coils in the floor. That causes, induces an EMF in the coils in the vehicle, which causes a current to flow, which then powers the vehicle. So, extremely efficient. You don't have to have batteries. You don't have to have a gasoline engine that's going to produce exhaust. Very clean. Very, very efficient. You pull up to that signal light, and you're in the turn lane, and somehow it knows you are there. Well, buried in the pavement are these inductive loops, coils of wire that sense when your car pulls in, 
when your car pulls in on top, and there's a misconception that these are pressure pads, they're not. When your car pulls in on top of that loop, basically you're putting a very massive chunk of iron inside that loop, which changes the mu naught value, which causes a change in the magnetic field, which then is sensed and the system knows, hey, there is a car there and it triggers it to change. These are actually becoming a little less common now, though they're still in use, because now we have recognition software that can use cameras and recognize that it is a vehicle there. I know in the stoplight in Terrace Park, cameras are there, and I know there are ones other places. So this is a technology that is still out there a lot, but we will start to see this disappear. Let's extend into the fun applications. Bring this together. We have over here on the left side, a square loop. And that square loop is in an external magnetic field that is constant. If it's a constant field, what happens in the loop? Well, if it's a constant field, you have no d phi dt. If you have your no d phi dt, you have no induced EMF. So nothing happens there. If we change things a little bit, if we have an increasing magnetic field, negative ND T, D phi dt, don't forget about the negative, lens is law, we fight the change. So if you point your thumb out of the screen in the direction of the magnetic field, that's what we don't want to reinforce because it's increasing. So then we rotate our thumb into the screen and we want to cause a magnetic field by what's going on in the loop into the screen. Well, that means that we're going to induce an EMF or an electric current in that clockwise direction. Well, what happens if it's a circular loop? Same thing. Shape doesn't matter. So then we would induce that and induce this EMF or this current. Well, what happens if this is a cat-shaped loop? Exactly the same thing. We would induce this EMF or this current to cause this field that fights the existing field. So then square, circular, cat-shaped, whatever, if it's a closed loop, you're going to induce a current in whatever that loop is. So then what if there's no loop? Well, if there's no loop, then we can't have a current because there's nothing to be able to carry the current. So then can we have an EMF? Well, if you're going to have an EMF, then typically you separate charges. You have a positive region and a negative region, and that constitutes a potential difference. We don't have any charges to separate. So then it's really hard to talk about an EMF being there. But if you go more basic than an EMF, and here's where it's time for ed, V is equal to E times D. You can't really cause a voltage, but an electric field doesn't require charges. You can have an electric field that is established. So then what I'm going to do is draw an electric field in the same direction that we have previously been drawing that EMF you will induce an electric field. Let's extend a little bit from our base equation. E equals negative N d phi dt. We have our Faraday's law equation, but we need to restate this equation because we can't induce this EMF. So we're gonna use ed or the counterpart of ed, calculus integral of e dot ds, negative integral of e dot ds. Now, 
the negative that is right here is going to be the same negative that's right there. So you'll see me keep the negative even though it looks like it should divide out. It is indeed the same negative, so I will keep it. So then we're going to put in for EMF, the integral of E dot ds is equal to negative n. n doesn't really make any sense anymore because we don't have a loop. We're going to drop n. The next thing we're going to add there is as we produce this electric field, it's being produced by the magnetic field. And just like if you had a charge there, entering that magnetic field, it would circulate. This electric field will be a loop. So I'm going to make that a closed integral. This is still Faraday's law, but it is referred to as the general form of Faraday's law. So let's consider this example here. We have a magnetic field, and we have our different radius values given. And we want to know the induced electric field at point P2. General form of Faraday's law. Closed integral of E dot dS equals negative d phi dt. We have a changing field. That's going to affect the phi. So if we look on the right side, negative, this will be B dot A over dt. The area is not changing. So if we consider where point P2 is on our diagram, if I can carefully draw this, that's a perfect circle. Use your imagination. So at point P2, we will induce an electric field that opposes the change, opposes the d phi dt. Well, if we think about the d phi dt, B is going into the page. So if you point your thumb into the page, that's where your field is. If you look at the equation, 0.03t squared plus 1.4, as time passes, that equation is always going to have the same sign of value. So then it's always going to be into the page. That means that negative d phi dt, what we induce, will oppose that. So if you flip your hand around so your thumb points out, we will induce an electric field that is in that counterclockwise direction. So then part B, direction, counterclockwise. So then B dot A, well, the area, because we're at point P2, is going to be that area of that purple circle that I just drew. So I'm going to pull the area out, and I'm going to go pi times, that would be the R2 value squared. And then we have a db dt. I'm going to stay on the right side, then I'll go back to the left side. So that's negative pi r2 squared db dt. If we take the derivative of our, of our equation up there, that's going to be a 0 0.06t. Now we're in pretty good shape on that side. If we go to the other side, closed integral of e dot ds, recalling closed integrals, the end result is that we're going to get the closed integral of ds, or the circumference there. Now, let's think about e, and let's think about the dot product, where the area vector is going to be perpendicular to the area of the purple circle that I drew. So, dot product, I'm going to be same opposite direction. Okay, we're going to get a 1 or a negative 1 there. So I'm not worried about that. If you think about the B equation, it's a second power equation. So the derivative is a first power equation. So B is changing. If B is changing, that's going to cause a changing E. So the first thought is, well, E is changing and DS is changing. Nothing pulls out. But E changes with a function of time. That's not what we're integrating with respect to. We're integrating with respect to ds. So we have no trouble pulling e out because it's not a function of ds. It's a function of t. So then e, closed integral of ds, will give us a circumference, which will be a 2 pi r2. I'm going to bring that down. So then one of our r2s will divide out. And when we solve for e, pi will divide out also. We're going to get r2 over 2 times 0.06t, or let's see, r2 was 
0.02 meters over two, and then we have a 0 0.06, and then we have a time of three seconds. So when we calculate all that, and the negative is along there somewhere, I dropped it. Uh, the negative doesn't tremendously matter because we've already stated what the direction is right there. Now, one more application I wanna throw out to you. Better sit tight for this one. Let's kind of summarize what we know. Magnetic fields, electric fields, caused by. Well, we know we can cause a magnetic field if we just have a simple magnet. We know we can cause a magnetic field also if we have moving charges. Electric fields? Well, electric fields are caused just by plain old charges. But then we also just saw in the general form, if we have a d phi dt, or we have a changing flux, then we're going to induce an EMF. By the add equation, we're going to induce an electric field. Now, if we think about this d phi dt, if this is just proportional to, if your field is proportional to t, then you're going to get a d phi dt that is a constant. If your field is proportional to, say, a, a t squared, then you're going to get a d phi dt that changes. Well, if you have a changing d phi dt, then that's going to cause a changing electric field. If you have a changing electric field, well, it's going to cause a changing magnetic field, which is going to cause a changing electric field. So let's kind of put this in terms you're a little bit more familiar with, perhaps. Let's suppose I start the change by having an oscillating charge. So I have an electron right there, and I'm going to have this electron oscillate around. Well, that would be a moving charge, a changing electric field, and that's going to cause a changing magnetic field. Use your imagination as best I can. I'm going to draw this perpendicular there. So there is my changing magnetic field. That changing magnetic field is going to cause a changing electric field. Well, that changing electric field is going to cause a changing magnetic field. And that changing magnetic field is going to cause a changing electric field. You get the point yet? Well, we have this kind of chain of changing electric, changing magnetic, changing electric, changing magnetic that are always perpendicular to each other. So reach back into your memory of things that we have pondered in physics in the last two years. What is this? Hopefully, I would be thrilled if you realize what this is. Let me add a little more detail. Here we have a nucleus. And we have an electron that is in a certain orbit. And what is that electron doing? It is jumping to another orbit and then falling back down from that orbit. And what does an electron produce when it jumps and falls between orbits? Light. This is light. This is an electromagnetic wave. Got to ponder that for a second. Got to let that sink in. This, as we have just drawn it, is that. You have a changing electric field causing a changing magnetic field. Your electric field is in red. Your magnetic field is in blue. They are always perpendicular to each other. Why are they both there? Because one literally causes the other. The changing electric field causes the changing magnetic field, which causes the changing electric field, etc. 
This is what light is and why and how we explain light being produced and light being propagated. It's not hard to propagate. It's not hard to get it to travel because one changing field naturally causes the other changing field. Ponder physics.